and at brownpapertickets.com. Join us, won't you? April 12th, the Hillside Club for KPFA. Support dissent. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online at kpfa.org. The time is 2 p.m. Stay tuned next for About Health. Good afternoon and welcome to About Health. On today's show, I will interview a man who had a traumatic injury in the prime of his life five and a half years ago. One seemingly normal summer day turned into a horrific night that completely changed his life. Following his undergraduate studies, Arash Bayatmaku used his knowledge of five languages to work in dozens of countries throughout four continents. He completed an MBA focusing on social enterprise and entrepreneurship, and he co-founded Streets of San Francisco Bike Tours. He also worked for two clean tech startups. Arash suffered a traumatic cervical spine cord injury in 2012 and was given a dire prognosis for recovery. Since then, he has worked tirelessly to defy the odds and achieve his ultimate goal of getting back on his feet through really relentless rehab and exercise. Arash has written a memoir, Little Big Steps, a life-changing injury and the inspirational journey to overcome the odds. It details the pivotal moments, the interactions and breakthroughs in the first two years following his injury. And he is still working just as hard as ever on improving his condition. Arash Bayatmaku, welcome to About Health. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. You know, Arash, it's hard to know where to begin, um, but I think I'd like you to tell folks a little bit about your life days before your accident and then, you know, like what you were doing and what life was like for you. And then tell us what happened and the journey from there. I know you've talked about it as going from the John Muir Trail to the John Muir Hospital. Um, so tell us about it. Sure. Um you know, in the days leading up to my injury, I was living a relatively uh, productive and happy life. I had graduated from my MBA program at USF, and I was living in San Francisco. I was working uh, for a solar energy company and um, really living life to the fullest. Um, I was excited about my work. I enjoyed uh, the challenges and 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 everything that came with working in sustainable business and and renewable energy. And on the on top of that, I spent as many moments as I could outside. I would go hiking. I would go camping on the weekends. I would escape the summertime fog of San Francisco and uh, make it out to Yosemite and the Redwoods and you know everywhere I could. And so I was you know, doing relatively well for myself and, and, uh, you were living a good life. I was living a good life. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't have everything figured out. I no. was still, how old were you then? I was 30. Yeah. I was right. 30 and, yeah. uh, was living with my best friend in a wonderful apartment and, and really just enjoying, um, the life of uh, a relatively stable and happy 30 year old person with many, uh, interests and, and pursuits. So uh, that was really the context uh, in which I was living in before this injury occurred. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about the injury, because I know when I read the book, too, I, you know, I wanted to picture and understand what happened to you and then how it was for you when you then woke up. Um, from the injury, it's it's pretty profound. Yeah, it's it definitely was profound, and it's something that uh, it will never escape my memory. Um, I was, you know, it was a, a summer day, typical kind of summer uh, foggy day in San Francisco, and a coworker of mine who had 
only recently come to know, had invited me to his uh, to his apartment out in Walnut Creek uh, because the weather was better. And he said, "Why don't you come out here? We're having a party at the our swimming pool in my apartment. There's some nice people, everything." So I said, "Sure, why not?" So uh, I drove out there and uh, spent the day uh, making new friends, uh, meeting new people, and 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 just enjoying a nice summer day. Uh, that evening when we came back to his apartment um, after dinner, he realized that he was locked out of his apartment and that the keys were inside the apartment and that we, you know, we wanted to get in. So right, was, and you were strong and a climber. I was and strong. 30 and, years old. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I, and I wasn't like a formal mountain climber or anything, but I'd scrambled around rocks and climbed up trees my whole life and just a pretty able bodied person. And so uh, when he mentioned, oh, yeah, this has happened to me before, and I've thought about actually climbing in through the balcony um, in the past, and I said, oh, sure, well, I can do that. Then I looked up there and I saw a couple of balconies stacked on top of each other. It was on the third floor. Or his his apartment, so third story, and I kind of just looked at it and said, "Yeah, I can do that. I'll jump up on one balcony, climb up to the next one, and climb up onto his and get in." And um, not a good decision. Yeah, um, definitely not a good decision. As I did basically get up to his apartment, and just as I was pulling myself up onto that last balcony, and um, and that's where I. For a matter of, I don't know how many seconds, my brain has blocked that out. I don't remember. All I remember was hanging on that balcony, pulling myself up, and the next thing I know, I'm lying flat on my back on the ground, looking up. It's night sky, stars out, and um, my coworker and a couple other people are looking down at me, and I can just see the horror and shock in their faces, and all they're saying is, don't move help is on the way. Wow, what That's a, when what I knew something moment. was wrong. Yeah, what a moment. And you know, I think many of our listeners can think back to moments in their lives when they've, you know, again, made what seems like a pretty, you know, I can do this kind of decision and then something happens. And and forever you look back at that and say, how did how did that happen? You know, what really happened there? And it, it, it it's interesting how our brain also takes care of us in some ways sometimes by blocking out all of it Absolutely. you know some of it and, and and so that we can keep moving on so from there you knew you were alive I knew I was alive uh, and from there the next couple of hours are kind of flashes in and out of consciousness uh, I mean I have very clear memories I have memories of the the EMTs arriving and strapping me to a gurney uh, strapping my head to uh, the stretcher and so and then it, again, it's kind of in and out, right. uh, and then you know flashes of uh, being in a hospital, being wheeled around, getting going into a uh, uh, CAT scan, and them scanning my brain for an injury there. Seeing the horror on your parents' face. Is, yeah. Yeah, 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 that wasn't till a little bit later, but yeah, exactly. So just kind of coming in and out, and realizing that things were pretty wrong. And really, it wasn't until a couple of hours later, I think, when. I was in bed with a halo strapped to my head and neck, bracing me, and waking up and then seeing the faces of my parents looking down at me uh, at four in the morning and realizing that something was really, really wrong. Yeah, and you shattered your C5, your cervical 5 and cervical 6, and they wound up putting rods um, even further from, I think, C4 to C7. That's right, that's right. So you, um, you were now that person who was learning way too fast all about what it's like to be in the beginning of recovery from a spinal cord injury. Yeah, and... Previous to that moment, I didn't know anything about this injury. I, d I didn't even really understand what it meant. Uh, I didn't have a frame of reference. I didn't know anybody previously in my life who'd had a spinal cord injury or who had dealt with any kind of paralysis. And so I just had nothing to refer to. Uh, and really, I would say it took 
really weeks to fully comprehend what had happened because even in those first moments being told that I have a spinal cord injury, feeling myself strapped in a halo and this funky bed that's swinging my lower body side to side to keep the blood moving and keeping everything stable. Not, I, I didn't really realize what was Plus, going you know, on. the you needed a lot of pain medicine at that point too. Oh, and I so was you were in so the zone. So heavily medicated. Right. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, you were, you were really in the zone. You know, you said something um, in your book or maybe in your blog that I read. Um, you said that you led your entire life with the belief and desire to make the most of every moment, and that following the spinal cord injury, you said you faced two options. One was to listen to the doctors and medical specialists and accept and adapt to your damaged body with little to no hope for improvement. And then your second choice was to commit yourself fully to prove them wrong and work diligently towards regaining function and getting back on your feet. And so tell us a little bit about when you made sort of that choice and what what the choice was for you. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, It's... It was a pretty easy decision for me because in that situation, uh, I'll speak for myself, but I'm, I'm, I've talked to many others too. And it seems like that's relatively a consistent pattern, but I was told this is the way to deal with this. The way is get used to it. This has happened. Don't deny it. Don't run away from it. The sooner you can accept the sooner you can realize that this is your new reality, that you have a new body now, you have a new life, the sooner you will find happiness and and go back to your life. Those were the these were the, the the words and the language that was used. Well, the word, the other words was "you'll never walk again." Yeah, exactly. Right. That was that was the clear. You know, you're never gonna you're never gonna walk. You're not gonna regain much function. Everything you might gain is gonna be in the first six months to a year, two years if you're lucky, and 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 beyond that, what you have is what you have, and don't expect anything. And so there was a constant emphasis on taming expectations, on adaptation on acceptance um although that word itself is 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 you know fraught with some some issues there because you can accept what has happened um but still choose to seek a certain path and that's really what i not having that acceptance limit you so it's accepting exactly. but not having that be a fait accompli you know like exactly right exactly and so back to your question you know i was told okay this is the way and uh, to me, it was relatively obvious. It, the The question was, well, how how much am I going to improve? Am I aren't I going to improve? It's it's an injury like anything else. Someone breaks an arm, they tear an ACL, they injure their shoulder, their ribs, or you know whatever. And isn't there some level of our body wanting to take us back to what uh, you know it was before that? And so. W- when all I was being told was that this is the way it is and that there would likely be no changes or improvements or very little improvements and just to accept it, it just didn't sit right with me. And yes. so I could feel it in my heart, in my gut. Um, in your soul, and in your my spirit. Soul. It was just, it was so obvious. And even now I can, as I'm talking about it, yeah. I can feel it in my chest. There was just a, a voice and an energy within me that said, this can't be right. There has to be another way. So that's where yeah, to your point. And, exactly. and you know, so there's this whole thing called denial that, that um, actually is a good strategy sometimes. You know, so there's there's a thing called denial, and then there's knowing that you had in your heart that, no, I am not going to be finished at two years when they say I should be done with all my recovery. So you're not really in denial. You're really in your knowing. But also some denial, I think, works well for us as a strategy to get through sort of the day-to-day horror of what's just happened. You you said it really, really well. Um, and I think that... Yes, there's a, you can almost call it like an active denial or, or, you know, a conscious action that we are taking to frame this life, this situation, the way we want to frame it. And that is, in my situation, different than it was being framed for me. Right. So you're absolutely right. There was an element of taking everything in and educating myself and obviously hearing and listening to what doctors and specialists were telling me but there was also an element of understanding that well 
I'm not, I don't have to accept all of this because it might be for my own self-interest to not accept all of this. And, uh, and we can talk about this later, but, you know, fast forward, you know, once I started educating myself and learning of other stories and other situations, then it became crystal clear that there absolutely is no reason to take what is being told to me as an absolute mm-hmm. uh, and to frame things the way I want to frame them. And right, your agency. And that's what I've done nonstop. You've had, you had agency. You, you know, there's something about also your, probably the way you were raised and, and the things you went through as a child and, you know, your tenacity and your temperament. You know, people have different temperaments and um, that that was like, no, I'm not just going to say I'm giving up. You know, I, I just went for the second time to see the play called uh, My Stroke of Luck, Diane Ann Barnes um, is now a friend. I adore her. And, um, you know, she had a stroke and she was a physician. And she was telling us at the talk back uh, on Sunday how, again, people told her, you know, all your your change and healing is going to be within two years. And she wants everyone to know that's not true. Is just not true. Um, maybe it's true for a few people. It may be, but but in general, what she found was that the more she worked and the more resources she got to get help, the more she was able to become this new person, not the old person, but the new person who she could be. So it sounds like you knew that. You knew that um, you weren't going to listen to everything that said. And I, I, I just want to... Um, talk a little bit about what some of the medical staff said to you. Um, you, you said that, um, you know, you heard people say, oh, you'll get used to it. It's not that bad once you figure things out. And there was one hospital worker who even said to you just days after the surgery to look on the bright side. Tell us what she said. She said at least when you go to a Giants game or a, a concert or some kind of large event, at least you will have a seat when you're waiting in line. (laughs) And it just, that just really, really um, upset me. It enraged me. Uh, and and even if even if my injury wasn't as bad, even if I just let's say broken a leg or something, just the assumption on her part that I would want to be sitting down in that situation, that's that's not me. I'm I always I walked up the stairs. I couldn't. I'm I was an impatient. Um, still, I am in many right. ways. I'm an impatient kind of antsy person. I always want to get things done as fast as I could. I didn't like to wait for elevators. I'd walk up the stairs. I'd walk down the stairs. So for me, the thought of being at a Giants game, even able-bodied, I'd want to be standing because. I don't want to just be sitting down. So just this presumption that the person had that comfort and happiness comes with taking a, a, a seat and being, you know, quote unquote, comfortable in that situation. It was so upsetting in that moment, but it was just an indication of the mindset or, or the approach that so many people uh, in the medical establishment use, which is just for, again, for some people, it's fine. Maybe plenty of people, I'm sure, would think, yeah, it's great to be sitting in line at a, at a Giants game or at a concert or something. But for me, oh, that's not the no case. And so you don't want to yeah. generalize that but and the truth project is, that. The know? truth is, no one would give up their freedom to be able to walk to be in order to sit in a wheelchair. Let's exactly. face it. I don't, I think, you know, I don't know anyone who would do that. And I, I think what happens, Arash, is that, um, people are so uncomfortable with another person's sort of suffering or uncertainty or difference that's going on or whatever, that rather than being mindful about what they say, they sort of say something out of this nervousness mm. and this lack of really noticing who the person is. There's there's this discomfort. You know, the same thing happens when someone dies, um, when, when there's some other trauma. People tend not to breathe and just be with what's going on and they tend to say things that don't make any sense and I think people don't realize how much words matter yes 
And energy. you now know that really yes. well, right? And, and words matter. Those two, those two words are two words that I uh, emphasize a lot in my own day-to-day thinking and, and methods uh, to recovery, but also in the speaking that I do and throughout my book and through my blog and everything that I talk about. I've written a lot about it. I talk about it uh, extensively is exactly that. I say those two words, words matter. And I'm going to be willing to screw up and say the wrong thing Mm -hmm. in order not to avoid you, Mm -hmm. which is another piece of that. You know, it's the same thing when we think about racial issues and social justice Mm -hmm. and issues around um, gender and equality. You know, sometimes people are afraid, oh my God, I'm going to say the wrong thing. But if you're mindful enough to to think about the fact that you don't, you want to be sensitive, you hope not to say the wrong thing, you may say the wrong thing, Mm -hmm. and then hopefully someone like you could say, well, you know, actually, I don't see it that way. I, this is how it is for me. So words do matter. And also at the same time, we shouldn't be afraid to just disconnect because we're afraid we're going to say the wrong thing. And I bet you had people coming to see you who just didn't know what to say. Absolutely. I had people come and tell me, you know, wishing you a speedy recovery. They probably thought it was just a matter of a few weeks or even if they, when they knew it was more serious than that. I think the assumption was, okay, when when's he going to go back to normal? Um, but yeah, a lot of people didn't know what to say and, and that was okay. And like you just said a moment ago, it's all right. People were there. The more, more important thing was that they showed up. They cared. They showed their love. They showed their support. I didn't care if they said something that was you know, uninformed or whatever, especially at that point, because what I was hearing from the quote unquote experts seemed rather uninformed to me. So absolutely. That's right. And the compassion there is for, you know, people, your friends and family, you know, who are just thrown off their balance. But there's less compassion than I feel as a nurse for 50 years. Mm -hmm. I, I, I always say for 50 years because I've seen a lot. I don't have a lot of compassion for the medical professionals who are thoughtless in terms of what they say and who give arbitrary timelines. You know, we sometimes ask people, how long will this take? And and I think a really thoughtful doctor, and there are many of them out there. There's I've worked with so many wonderful medical professionals. Susan Lindheim, I hope you're listening. Um, you know, who could say, you know, I don't really know, but in my experience, this is what I've seen. But leave that hope alive, right? But but when there's this arbitrary thing that feels like the person's on automatic and they're just talking to you as though you're just another number in some way, it's devastating. So you just touched on uh, one of the most important points of my whole story and something that I've always ready and willing to discuss, but if we can break it down a little bit. Yeah. You said... You know, the doctors being able to say, I don't know. And that's exactly the, 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 the point that I try to make in my book, in all of the work that I do. I understand, and everyone can probably identify with the fact that we all want answers. And especially when something bad happens to us, when something really traumatic and bad happens, we want answers. Like you said, people want to know, when am I going to get better? When am I going to improve? How much am I going to improve? Totally fine human, I would say it's a human instinct and that's fine. So we ask for those answers and I think this is where this point is exactly where there needs to be some change being made because when the instinct for wanting those questions answered is out there and that's natural and accepted then the I don't know that we mentioned a moment ago is where it's so important and I just wish I always say I never wanted the doctors to blow smoke up my rear end or tell me you know give me false hope and say oh yeah you're going to be you know 100% Part of words. That's not real. Yeah, that's yeah. not realistic. And I know I, I didn't want that then. I don't want that now. As I think back, you know, in hindsight, but all I wanted was for someone to be a little more honest with the fact that they really don't know, and even expressing what they told me in even a slightly more nuanced way could have been better and said, "Hey, most of the evidence is, you know, dot dot dot." 
but there is, uh, you know, we, we don't know all of the answers. Feel free to explore options, you know, whatever it is. There are, like said, things, there are new things there are being new things. developed. You know, we have all kinds of stem cell and, you know, robotics and all kinds of things being developed. So somehow... Leave keep, the door open. Leave the door open. Leave the door open. That's what yeah. I say. It's like, just yeah. leave that door open. Even if it's just a crack, leave it open. Leave it up to me to decide if I want to open the door, if I want to peek into the other side and see what's there or if I'm comfortable not going there and maybe that's the case for some people and that's fine but allow the person to have the agency to make that decision for themselves and give them the opportunity to know that it's not an absolute we aren't just all categorized and numbered and saying you have zero percent chance of this or two percent chance of that sure some of that is true and there is guidance to that i'm not i'm not dismissing all of you know experiences in the past and what doctors are relying on to make these judgments but just leave that door open say you don't know give me that chance let me work for it but that was not what i'd heard and then and then you also had the experience of you know you had i'm sure some great nurses some great doctors taking mm-hmm. care of you and then you also had the experience of limited help as well. You had a lot of help when you, especially when you were at, I think the Kaiser rehab Mm -hmm. facility. Um, there were, I love some of your stories in your book about that. We don't have to go into details here, but there were pluses and minuses of, of, of the great new equipment they had, not all being used. Um, and then you had some people who just shouldn't have been there helping you. They, they weren't, um, they weren't helping. That's right. Yeah. So um, that's the reality. And for anyone who's dealing with any medical issue, you have to be your own advocate. And um, I I just see that over and over and over again, that you have to do your research. You have to figure out what's out there. And you had the real advantage that some people don't have of having a very supportive family. Unbelievably fortunate for that could not ask for a more supportive, loving family, community, friends. Um, the level of uh, involvement and support and and love and encouragement that I received from everyone around me still to this day astounds me. And I was, uh, yeah, I was very fortunate that way and uh, still do feel very fortunate for the community that I, that I had that really was, I, I leaned on very heavily. Um, right. And, and when I would tell them what I was thinking or how I was approaching things, thankfully, they supported me. Whether they, maybe they privately disagreed with me or thought that I was maybe being boneheaded or naive or who knows, but they supported me and, and have supported me continuously from day one. And being a caregiver is a really hard job. I'm mm-hmm. sure your parents went through a lot of sacrifice. Oh my in, gosh. In order to do that. And I think anyone listening who is a caregiver for a friend, a loved one, family member who has had cancer or an injury or um, a surgery of any type, whatever it is, you're often the unsung heroes in terms of the amount of energy and time it takes to support the person who's been injured. Absolutely. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. I was, I, I really, I'm not happy that I put my family through that. There was no intentionality there. There was no intentionality there. (laughs) Um, But, you know, for them to go to sleep one night, everything's fine, and then wake up the next day, and their lives are changed forever, too. So I'm really glad you brought that up because it is true. It's not just the people who are injured or going through whatever condition or whatever it is. It is everyone around them. It is those, uh, the, the family, the support people, the friends, the community that are impacted so tremendously as well so it is important to recognize that and yeah I still to this day I feel terrible about what my family had to go through again I was lucky enough to have a loving supportive family who basically had no choice but to put everything on hold to uh, take care of me I'm talking with Arash Bayatmaku he's uh, the author of a memoir Little Big Steps and um, you know it's a life 
changing injury that he had and a real inspirational journey and he's talking with us about this because he had a spinal cord injury uh, five and a half years ago but so much of what he has learned and what he writes about is relevant to many people who have had some kind of illness or trauma because there is a process um, that people go through and we've already identified the importance of hope that words matter let's get into some of the practical stuff of what you want to tell people about your your experience with insurance companies. <laughs> oh boy, yeah. Can we reform the entire healthcare industry? I think just, so. Uh, I'm ready. I'm down for well, it. Let's do it, huh? Just a small undertaking. You know, I, I again, because I was a nurse back in the 60s, I have seen the change. You know, back then, the insurance company didn't decide and we had a lot of problems when I was first a nurse. There was no ICU. It didn't yeah. exist, you know, so there was it was antiquated, you know, but it also was a system where insurance companies didn't decide whether you were going to get the right PT, physical right. therapy or OT or acupuncture or whatever else you needed. And tell us a little bit about what you want us to know about your your challenges with insurance. Well, uh, that could be an entire uh, <laughs> 10 volume memoir on its own, but uh, I'll leave but no that. one will read it. I'll, I, yeah, I'll <laughs> leave that to the to the work I continue to do now. But um one of the things that stands out when thinking of that is the fact that I was in the ICU for, for a few days, had my surgery, reconstructed my neck, uh, and then a few days in an inpatient intensive, uh, or not ICU, but, you know, uh, a different unit. And then, so about 10 days after the injury, I was transferred to inpatient rehab where I was going to be for the next few weeks. And one of the things that stands out to me is that upon basically upon entering that unit so we're talking 10 days after i've shattered my neck the heel of the wounds are still stitched up you know i have a huge neck collar that i'm supposed to wear for the next three months they had already decided what my discharge date was going to be so without knowing how you were doing without knowing how i was doing yeah i mean at that point i had just been lying on in bed for for 10 straight days i hadn't done anything i hadn't even started you know really any pt pt until then just consisted of doing things in bed um with whatever i could but you know just upon just days after that being being told that they knew when my discharge date was going to be that just really shocked me so that was when it was one of the many indications that okay this profit motivated healthcare system is trying to minimize cost because that's all they're seeing me as a cost and they are trying to transfer the burden of care out of their hands onto in this case my family and again i was lucky enough to have people who would take that burden on but I, for so right. many i I, I don't know. I, I don't even know how that would work. Right. And, and you were lucky to have insurance. I was lucky to have insurance through my work, thankfully. Yeah. yeah. But the fact that, you know, these decisions and, and it, it none of it had to do with, well, let's see how far he can get or, or uh, you know, to achieve any kind of re recovery of function. Aside from that, everything was geared in that rehab time in those five and a half weeks I was in rehab. Everything was geared to just get me as functional enough to go home. That's right. And, you know, you write very well about uh, <laughs> the OT, I think it was, the occupational therapist. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think you really uh, communicate that she did not understand that you were not going to be satisfied with just functioning well enough to, to live by yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and so, just to be clear, so the OTs I had in rehab were actually very good. They helped me regain quite a bit of function in my hands and arms. They really, they mm -hmm. did a good job, a great job, I'll say, of identifying what I had, helping me strengthen it. Uh, it was still all geared towards just getting me out the door. Right. But the the story you're referencing to is, is one, as soon as I'd come out of the hospital and I'm back 
back at home in a totally different home because my parents' home wasn't wheelchair accessible, so they had to rent an apartment, et cetera, et cetera. Whole another part of the story. But this was the home care OT who would come to my house for once a week and was trying to help me. And all I was asking, I was begging her, was just, can you just do some of the same things I was doing in the hospital? This was good. And credit to the healthcare, you know, that I had. They were doing a good job. And I said, can you do any of this, you know, electrical stimulation on my hands? Can we do this icing stuff I was doing and heat and exercises? And and she just had no answers. She, she had, had no, no answers, answers and, and had no motivation. And no really. compassion. No compassion. And, and yeah. you know, and that's when I was, um, I was listening to it actually on Audible rather than reading it. But so I was listening to it while I was cooking and um, doing chores and things like that. And that, that chapter in particular really got to me. The idea that um, medical professionals, you know, would not make a care plan, you know, as a nurse, you, you make a care plan and you, you draw from the past to plan for the future. Mm-hmm. You, you know, you don't isolate uh, just your own agenda. And and when it's when there's uh, someone providing you know incompetent care, it's infuriating, especially when you are at the mercy in some way of what the insurance company will and will not pay for, and you Absolutely. have to decide what am I willing to pay for. And I think you really reached out to your community to help you with that decision. Yeah, absolutely. I, it's it was you know it was it goes back to the you know being able to listen a little bit. And this particular OT was just not listening to me. I would tell her over and over again. I would say, please, like, can we work on this? Can we do something else? And she was just relying on her frame of reference of, well, what if you want to make a sandwich right now? What if you want to go in the kitchen and make yourself? She kept bringing up the sandwiches. And you don't eat sandwiches, right? Yeah, and I don't even really like sandwiches (laughs) a whole lot, but she was just obsessed with getting me to figure out how to make a sandwich. And (laughs) I was just like, lady, help me just get my hands stronger. Everything else will be easier. Sandwiches are one thing, but I have to take care of my hygiene. I have to dress myself. I have to do all these things. And can't you see that by addressing the the, the root issue, maybe getting my hands 5, 10, 20 percent stronger, everything else will be better from that. So stop focusing on one specific task and wasting my time by going on Amazon in front of me right. and taking 10 times as long as I would take. You know, so it was, yeah, it was, it was a, that was a major point of failure. So I think for everyone, you know, whatever field you're in, um, the, the, the moral here is listen. You know, listen to yes. what a person has in mind. And, you know, I was just struck, um, Arash, about as you're talking, you're so strong. You know, you're moving around in, uh, here in the studio, and I realize you, you've really come a long way from that time. Um, you, you, you just look so strong. <laughs> and, um, I, and I'm really moved by that. And I and I thought Thank maybe you. we could talk a little bit about the kinds of therapies that worked. Sure. You know, like, what was it that, number one, um, you could tell us a little bit about Hawaii, but, you know, what is it that kept your, um, uh, that helped you keep your, uh, what is it, resilience and, and your motivation up? You know, who were the people and what did they do that really supported your motivation when it came to physical therapy trainers? Um, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, I think the common link uh, to anyone I've worked with since my injury that really impacted me positively was... If they shared a similar vision of potential, of hope, of possibility. So after leaving the hospital, after realizing that I wasn't going to get a whole lot from my insurance, um, yeah, my friends, family, community stepped in. They helped me fundraise. They helped me find a lot of different alternative things to do. So I started taking things on um, and doing as much as I could. I went to a local place here in the Bay Area that had a specialized uh, kind of exercise program for people with spinal cord injuries, and 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 they were great. They helped a lot um, to continue to strengthen what I had and everything. But the 
the the the method that really impacted me the most from the beginning that you're referring to uh, and that has continued to help me the most and what I still do today was a method called neurokinetic Pilates that uh, a, a woman in Maui who I'd been introduced to through another gentleman who'd had a spinal cord injury, he had told me, hey, this is amazing. This this person, she really knows what she's doing. You might want to check her out. And so, um, you know, a year and a half or so after my injury, I'd been doing a lot of different things, but I decided, okay, let's let's try this out and went to Maui and worked with uh, Alejandra as her name. And that was absolutely, you know, just completely life-changing because her mentality just the way she talked to me, the language she used, she listened to me, and everything was framed with an open-endedness that I absolutely loved. Because I'll be honest, those those first that first year or two after my injury, I felt a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure from myself because I felt like there was a, to- a clock ticking. Right, you, you you know you hear two years, man. I hear two years, yeah, and and <laughs> oftentimes it was one year, it was six months, you know. So six months, one year was the more common. Then they say two. Years years is the absolute max. So in my head, you gotta get every going. day I wake up and I yeah. think, oh my gosh, I'm one day closer. I'm 24 hours closer to that ticking clock, you know, and then <laughs> counting after that, down. There's no and change. after that, that's it. And, which, and you start, you know, I start making calculations. Well, I've only improved this amount in the last three months. So project that out to another three months and six months. And so... And it just, the body just doesn't work that way. The neurological system doesn't work that way. The, the stress goes core, up. Your stress every, goes Yeah, up. anxiety and stress. And what I loved about just every interaction with Alejandra, and this goes with to other, you know, people that I've had positive interactions with too, was just she wasn't looking at it in the same way. It was like, oh, well, yeah, in, in a couple of years, maybe you'll be able to get to this point and then you can continue to strengthen. And, and so there was just this open-endedness that really... It calmed me. It confirmed and validated my own hope and sense of possibility. And it continued to fuel my fire to keep going. And and she showed you a new way to think about your body and your injury, correct? She showed me a very new way to... Uh, look at everything and it was you know kind of her own system that she'd designed her background was in Pilates and physical therapy she'd had a lot of direct experience in neurological conditions so she wasn't just you know randomly shooting for ideas she'd had a ton of experience she developed a method it was grounded in a lot of other fundamental teachings and things that were already established and and uh, and she created her own system and that just it opened such a door to me because, first of all, because it had results. Because in right. two weeks of working with her, I progressed more than I'd had in months of doing everything else that I had. And once I was able to kind of see my body just connect in a different way, or maybe it was her allowing, uh, giving me the chance to not feel as anxious and not feel as nervous about that ticking clock and that two-year deadline, then it was kind of like, okay, well, I can continue to improve. Changes do, but art can possibly be made, which to me was always what felt right all along. I, I did not understand the logic that our body, our heart and blood and veins and everything, and I'm not a physician, I don't even know the technicalities of things that well, but it just didn't make sense to me that why would your body rush to, to, to do what it could to recover and improve and then on day 366 or you know whatever it is or on the two done. year mark it just you know, oh, okay sorry we're done we're going to stop now it just didn't make sense it just so, didn't make sense and we're learning so much about neuroplasticity exactly. and how um, you know our brain changes our body changes you know I did a, a, a show last week it's on my website about what's making our kids sick and a lot of we were talking about it is the GMOs and the pesticides and the toxins that are making kids sick and then all of a sudden you take those things away and a child overnight almost can get better usually it takes a few weeks or a month or so but I it's, it's this idea that we have to have a little magic. We have to do a lot of detective work and things can change. We don't always know sort of the root causes of why things don't change. Um, you know, and so for some people, dietary changes and all of a sudden their body changes. For you, 
there's an idea that there are connections that may not reconnect, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't know that for sure unless you push the limits of what you can do. And yeah. and sometimes people get discouraged. Now, there are people who have pushed those limits and still, you know, can't do what they wish they could. Yeah. But um, not giving up, having that hope. And and also talking to others. I, I just want to say, you, you found um, Alejandro. Alejandro? Alejandro, yeah. Alejandro, yeah. by talking to someone else. Yep. And and that's a key piece of recovery is that networking of what's worked for people, yep. how how they have succeeded. So were you able to take the work with her and then translate that with the other people you were working with, the, the physical therapists you were working with? Long story short, yeah. I, it took some time. Um, it wasn't an immediate thing, and it's not something I could just, you know, write down or, or, or describe in one video or, or book or something. And and uh, But over time, I, you know, I came back, and I was very open about my experience. I was sharing it with the other people I would see at the rehab gym I'd go to here and tell them about it. Many of them followed suit and actually went out there to Maui and worked with her themselves and they came back with the same kind of whoa kind of like what just happened you know experience and so like I said long story short yeah it got validated over time and then little by little I was able to to introduce some of the practitioners I was working with here to the principles and methods and then then you then then you're doing good because then you're combining the best of all worlds because yeah. the the people I worked with here then could rely on their their knowledge and what they knew uh uh, works, uh, and then also take in this new approach, this new idea, and uh, a couple of them went out there and worked with her themselves and learned from her. So it's that's what it needs to be, especially with something as kind of mysterious and uh, still unsolved as a spinal cord injury. We have to just share knowledge. We have to keep an open mind. There needs to be dialogue, discussion. One idea I always have is just I want to take all these these very smart people, the practitioners that I've had great experiences with, and I want to almost say, get them all in one place, yes. you know, Alejandra and whoever else, these different people who I've met, who I have a lot of respect for, and I want to almost like lock them into a conference room right, for like for a, a week, week and, say, and just say, go, right, <laughs> you're right. not allowed to leave. Right, right, um, right, right. So, I, well, yeah. you know, I want to ask you, because um, you took some of what you learned and what you knew and your motivation and your passion. Um, to start a nonprofit called No Limits Collaborative. And That's I just right. want to make sure to um, give you a chance to say something about that because it's it's help for other people with spinal cord injuries and neurological conditions. Um, tell us a little bit about No Limits Collaborative. Yeah, No Limits was uh, directly a result of myself and uh, a, a couple of, you know, very like-minded uh, f- friends, they were friends and they were also people who I was working with for my recovery. Um, three others, in fact. And it was just kind of all, all of us realizing that we were on the same page. Myself from the standpoint of have, being someone who's gone through this injury. Them on the side of being physical therapists and practitioners who were working with people like me. So once we realized we're all on the same page, we realized that there is a huge hole, as I've mentioned um, today, of care that is lacking and resources and care and support and exercise that is lacking when people, you know, are are sent home, are are out of the hospital, they're trying to figure out what to do, their life has been completely turned upside down, and they just have no idea where to go, much like I was. And so we focused our efforts on finding a way to address that kind of that void, that hole. Mm-hmm. And so we started the nonprofit and with that specific intention and, and what we want to do and what we are trying to do and continue to strive to do is to provide uh, exercise opportunities, support, resources, uh, even if it's just conversations, one-on-one training, whatever it is, on, on, on as many levels as we can, we are trying to have an impact in that sense and provide people an opportunity to know that, hey, no, there are options, and there is are this, things. Is this in the Bay Area? Yeah, it's established uh, here in Oakland, uh-huh. uh, actually, yeah. and uh, we don't have a physical location, We, but uh, all the work we're doing right now is focused in 
the Bay Area, and we'd love to continue to expand and have a larger reach. So that's No Limits Collaborative, and um, you know, again, as a nonprofit, I'm sure you're trying to get funds so that you could help people. Because one of the things, as you're talking, I keep thinking about is so much of what you've had to do is with your own money. Yes. Um, and and you know, you're lucky; you can work. Yes. And, and you can make money. And yeah. um, I've heard your talks. They're wonderful. Um, but there are a lot of people who can't. Yes. Um, who have that kind of injury. I, I also want to ask you a little bit about um, something that I read that you said is that you learn to find joy and embrace moments of happiness despite all of your day-to-day challenges. And, and and you said that for the first few years after your injury, you lived with a mindset that, that sort of said that you shouldn't have happiness or yes. you shouldn't have joy. That shifted for you. That did. Yeah. 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 Would you say something about that? Sure. Yeah. That shifted. Uh, you know, those first few years, I, I was basically like... I think a lot in visual images. So my analogy was I just jumped on a horse and I was just whipping that horse and riding as fast as I could towards who knows where. And uh, as part of that, I told myself, well, I can't feel joy. I can't feel happiness because then I'm not on this horse. I'm not on this path of recovery or I'm taking away time from that. And uh, over time, I was able to transition that thinking and for the better. And I don't regret thinking that way I it's it was what it was at that time and I've always felt that you you do what you do at any given time because it feels right at least that's how I live my life but the transition happened largely because uh, I got engaged uh, to a wonderful woman who I'm now privileged to be married to and uh, I started to understand that okay there can be a little more balance I can be the fighter the the pioneer that I want to be and and continue to seek recovery and 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 improve my life and quality of life but i can also feel the joy that i've been kind of depriving myself of mm-hmm. for a long time and thanks to um thanks to britta my wife and to my family and friends and people who helped me kind of nourish and 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 encourage that that cultivate that ability to feel um that joy and so that's it's still a struggle i still struggle with it to this day uh but i've been much better about being able to take a moment and recognize that hey this is a happy moment there is joy in this situation and let me embrace that let me take that in boy because it might not be there tomorrow that's for sure because yeah. every day is a kind of a roller coaster ride when you're living with this injury right and you know i would imagine again a lot of people with these kinds of injuries need a lot of mental health support yes because um, depression can set in very easily um, oh, yeah. lack of hope um, wondering how how can I do this how can I get here and you know again for people who don't have someone like Britta or your family um, they need support and that's where again groups where people can talk, maybe if people can't go to support groups, listen to some of these things like your podcasts or or, or your TED Talks. And um, people people need to have connection. Yes. In order to do it. And um, we can't do it on our own. You can't. I know. Um, you know, you also said that you'll continue to listen to your body first and foremost and um, trying to strive for new connections and improvements. So on the one hand, you continue as we're talking about, you continue to push yourself. I do. You do. And mm. it sounds like from your book and what you're saying, you've also found a little bit of balance of how to take sort of those precious moments and days and also to enjoy them. Yeah, and that's where the title of the book comes from, Little Big Steps. It's it's acknowledging those little steps on the way to, you know, uh, f- achieving the larger steps and finding a balance of celebrating those accomplishments. And I've been able to find more balance in doing that. Uh, it's not just about um, what am I going to do today or what recoveries or, or functions am I going to regain at this exact moment. Um, I, for example, you know, I got 
really into swimming and doing stuff in the water. Right, five miles. Five miles, yeah. A that down, was my, a, a, where? A Donner, Donner Lake. Lake. Donner Lake, right, just right near Tahoe. Miles. Yeah, wow. it was it was something that started as a, you know, just a, another way to do therapy and do things in the water and uh, went from being barely able to do anything and needing two people to support me in the water to swimming one lap to swimming 20 laps and then a mile and then two miles and then when I didn't have any more uh, races around here to sign up for because the max was two and a half miles I said okay time to for me to do my own and so I uh, created my own swim up in Donner Lake I circumnavigated the entire lake and got 45 other people out there to swim with me and raise uh, a couple thousand dollars for my nonprofit. so what's next for you oh man <laughs> <laughs> well, a uh, couple of things. Uh, I continue to to do more speaking and to tr- try to get this message out. I'm not kidding when I say I do really want to reform the entire healthcare system. Okay, so anyone so out there listening? Can, yeah, anyone can, out there listening? They can contact you, wanna, you. Where do they contact you? Uh, they can contact me at rashrecovery.com. Uh, that's my website, and there's a contact form there, and uh, you can reach me there or among different social media and whatnot. And so you're going to reform. Reform the medical system. You're going to keep working the towards. System. I'm going to keep working on my body and achieving my personal goals. You can goals stand and, now for like an hour and a half. Yep, I can stand. I can do a lot of things in standing, and I'm going to continue to build on that to try to t- start to take steps and to uh, continue on with uh, everything I can. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Really, a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for coming in studio. That's Araj Bayatmaku. And his new book is Big Little Steps. It's more than a memoir. It's a call to improve the medical system. He is an inspiration for all of us while we face our own unexpected changes. He writes and speaks about resilience, courage, and the will to live. And he never gives up hope. Thank you for joining me, Arash. Thank you so, so much for having me. It's a pleasure. I look forward to reading more of your work. And um, again, arashrecovery.com. That's A-R-A-S-H, recovery. I'll be sure and put that link up on my website at nurserona.com, N-U-R-S-E-R-O-N-A.com. And um, I just, you know, am so, so moved by everything you're doing. And I'm just looking at the time. You know what? I think we still have a few minutes left. So... Now that back I don't have it. to end, sure. let's go back into it for just a minute here. Yeah. You were saying what you're looking forward to doing. So you're going to reform the medical system. Going to reform you're the medical system. Swimming. Going to keep swimming uh, and uh, really try to take some steps to to increase the impact of our nonprofit. Um, you know, we we have a couple different projects that we've been working on, and we really want to expand that. And one of those is uh, we've been working with UC Berkeley with providing training um, to students at UC Berkeley with disabilities of all kinds. So we're helping UC Berkeley with uh, training those students directly, training their athletic trainers on how to work with those students. And it's a model that the UC system has indicated they might want to expand to all 10 of their campuses, possibly, with Berkeley always leading the way. Uh, So that's something, you know, we're going to try to do. Uh, Another thing we, we, we work a lot on is getting people out and participating and challenging themselves uh, because recovery, like I said, it's that's one part of it, but it's also, I found it very fulfilling to achieve personal goals and allow that to fuel my recovery. So just like the swimming has been for me, we get people out to do triathlons, to swim or you know, um, to do uh, adaptive cycling or push themselves in their wheelchair, or whatever that is. And so we're going to continue to do that. This summer, we're really looking to uh, participate in even more events than we have for the last two summers. And uh, uh, look for us at any of the uh, local triathlon swims, runs in the Bay Area. It'll be our fourth year of being in the Oakland Triathlon, which is the largest urban triathlon in the West Coast. So we're going to keep doing things like that. And for me personally, I'm going to keep working on my myself and my recovery and spreading my message and uh, also living a fulfilling and <laughs> successful life as a husband and a son and, uh, yeah. and, and pursuing... Um, you know, personal fulfillment in those ways as well. Yeah, it's a really great story. I suggest that people check out um, Arash's book. It's Big Little Steps. It's really more than a memoir. It's uh, very, very inspiring. And you may know someone, you know, you may know someone who 
has, um, you know, I, I have a friend, for instance, who just had to have um, spinal surgery mm. from cancer. And all of a sudden, I watched her overnight go from someone who could get up and move and jump around to someone who couldn't. Now, she will. She's like you. She will be, you know, out there um, rehabbing really, really fast. I know her, and she has that same kind of energy you have. But I watched what happened, and I realized, you know, your book would be really good for her as well. Because, um, you know, it, it gives someone a, a, a real view, a path to say, you know, here I am, day one, day ten, one year, two years. And, and the years are going to keep going. It's five and a half years, and I'm not stopping. And I think we need to hear that, uh, especially when there's been some real trauma. So um, check out Big Little Steps, whether... Little uh, Big Steps. Oh, Sorry. you know, I keep Sorry. getting it mixed up. It's true. It's Big <laughs> Little Steps, and I keep wanting to say Little Big Steps. No, the other way around. It's, I know. It's <laughs> Big Little Steps. That uh, makes much more sense. No, it's Little Big Steps. No, little Big Steps. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I have dyslexia. So, if you look up my name, it'll come up pretty quickly. And uh, so you say it the right way, right? Little now. big steps. Little, little big, big steps. steps. <laughs> and my name, Arash. There aren't that many of us out there, so A R A S H. Google it, and it'll it'll pop up. Fabulous. Howdy, boys and girls. This is Chris Welch inviting you to join me every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 11 a.m. to noon for the talkies. We'll discuss almost everything: the news, of course, and also theater, music, books. Generally, what's happening happening in our own backyard and what we can do about it. Your questions and comments are a vital part of the proceedings. That's the Talkies, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, 11 a.m. to noon on KPFA. Nomi Prince, former Wall Street executive, current investigative journalist, has just brought out a new book, Collusion, How Central Bankers Rigged the World. She has that rare combination of deep knowledge and brilliant writing. Her new work throws unflinching light on the power players and dark conspiracies of international finance. Nomi Prince will speak on Sunday evening, May 6th, 7.30 at St. John's Presbyterian Church, 2727 College Avenue in Berkeley. There's wheelchair access at this KPFA benefit. Vilma V will host. Get tickets at independent bookstores or online at brownpapertickets.com. For Nomi Prince, May 6th. 